perfect. Welcome, everyone. Um, we've had a couple of uh, slight snafus on the uh, technical side, so um, I'm going to take over from Mark as the moderator, at least to start, until he's able to, to get online with us. So welcome to the Payment for Ecosystem Services um, session. Uh, we'll be discussing how can it work in COCO. Um, we have a great group of people today who will be discussing this topic, representing both um, topics that are specific to West Africa, where many of us have been working, as well as in a more global context as well. Um, so Mark Debray, who's the founder of Impactum, will be joining us um, when he's able to get online uh, and contribute into the conversation. We have Rosalind Fuzua Ajay from the, as the Director of Climate Change and the National Red Plus Focal Point for the Forestry Commission of Ghana. I'm very excited to have her here. We also have Daniel Arancibia, um, the co-director of Latin America for ProForce, which is an organization I'm sure many of you know. And then myself, Andrew Nobrega, I'm the director of North America and UK for Pure Projet, um, and we work with a number of you as well. So uh, a great group of people today to discuss the topic of payment for ecosystem services. Um, we are going to start with a couple of initial questions um, that we have prepared for the group to contribute and to contribute their thoughts um, on those topics. Uh, later on, we will be coming back with some questions um, that can come from the group. So we will open up the opportunity for everybody to, to ask questions to the panel directly. So um, I was initially to start with the, with the first question. So I will be introducing myself to start answering the first question. So um, the first question that we did have was, what do PES, Payment for Ecosystem Services, mean for you and your organization in terms of project implementation um, and then we'll follow that up with a discussion of what does that look like from a, a business case perspective. So if we could just go to the next slide. Perfect. So one thing I like to do when we're talking about payment for ecosystem services is to actually define what do we mean by ecosystem services in the first place. And that's what you see represented in the, in the diagram below. So you see generally ecosystem services will be categorized into one of four categories. Provisioning services, and that's something like providing sustainable timber or crops, um, other commodities from the agricultural landscape and the ecosystem landscape. Regulating services, which are those services that help to modulate different factors that affect our livelihood, the health of ecosystems, the production that we have. And there's a couple of little things that you can see drought is represented, flooding is represented, um, the regulation of the migration of diseases. These are the types of regulatory services we talk about when talking about ecosystem services. We also have cultural services, which is, you know, the value of nature to our, our religion, our ethics, to um, branding and communication is, is another one too, and place and identity of place. But more fundamentally, when we talk about it the, in, in the cocoa space, ecosystem services, what we're more regularly talking about are what are termed supporting services. So this is the provision of water through irrigation and natural irrigation microclimates. This is the provision of sun for photosynthesis. This is the churning of nutrients and nutrient cycles that help to produce healthy soils. This is the protection of our crops from sun and the other elements, and obviously the promotion of biodiversity. So often when we're talking about ecosystem services, we're talking about ways in which we're seeking to promote these ecosystem services. And then when it comes to payment for ecosystem services, we're talking about arrangements that basically link beneficiaries of those ecosystem services, whether that's um, a company who wants to see greater yields in its cocoa, an obvious topic here, um, a company that benefits from pollination services or a healthier water table, and that those beneficiaries reward those that are owning the land that provide those services and active, acting to either protect or promote those services over the long term. So in basic terms, that's what we talk about. In real terms at Pure Projet, when we're talking about e payment for ecosystem services, we're most regularly talking about payment for carbon services, as that's how we work with a number of our clients. Pure Projet works with uh, partners across the globe to implement positive impact projects in their global supply chain communities, tying ecosystem restoration to livelihood development for those communities, and fundamentally, when those companies are making their investments, there are diverse different benefits that they're looking at when they make those investments. But one of the valuable ones um, aligned with their sustainability strategy can be the production and promotion of carbon. It can be the production and promotion of biodiversity. It can be the protection and promotion of trees against deforestation claims. So it's really talking about what are the impact indicators that a company is seeking to implement in the field and, and, and benefit. 
And how do they contribute to that through investment, through payment for performance over time, through investment in livelihoods initiatives that help to promote that. So that's how we consider payment for ecosystem services models. Um, we do that through certified or non-certified avenues, different methodologies for accounting for those principles. Ideally in a landscape approach where you have a defined landscape that this can all be basketed within. Uh, and that's that's really how we, uh, we term payment for ecosystem services and what it means for us. It's fundamentally and invest, it's, it's a way to leverage the actions that we do to invest in the actions that we do for the holistic benefits that they promote. So that's, that's, that's from Pierre Perger's perspective on what does PES mean for you and for your organization. Uh, Rosalind, I'll go to you next and, and I'm happy to allow you to introduce yourself a little bit more and, and your role within these types of topics and then answer, answer that question. And Rosalind, we just have to have you come off mute. Sorry, thank you very much. And um, good evening to everybody who has joined us. I'm joining you from Accra and it's already evening and um, it's uh, an evening with some showers. So um, I work with the Forestry Commission as um, rightly introduced and at the Forestry Commission, what we do is to manage um, Ghana's forest and wildlife estates or resources. Now my specific role at the Forestry Commission is how we manage these resources very well so that we reduce deforestation and forest degradation. And at the same time, we develop programs and projects that help the drivers of deforestation and forest degradation also to find a balance because we are working in mosaic landscapes. Um, you can't just talk about forest without talking about agriculture. And you can't just talk about the forest also without talking about the people who dwell on these forests. So that's basically what I do. And we have been doing this um, actively through the Global Climate Change um, Program, Red Plus, that's reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. At the moment, we are managing two very huge landscape um, projects um, for two very important ecological zones in the country. The high forest zone where we have cocoa and where there's a lot of interest. And then also for the savannah zone in the northern um, parts of Ghana, where we have share, that gives us our share butter um, in most of our cosmetics. And so to move on to the topic of PES, um, I think that um, Andrew gave a very good introduction. And what it really tells us is that in one way or the other, we have been paying for ecosystem services, but we have not put them in a particular context according to the different types of ecosystem services. So if you talk about cocoa, you talk about forest. Um, in Ghana, we have been given out legal permits for people to harvest forest products. Um, for their livelihood needs. It's an ecosystem service. And um, this has been done over time. Just that now when the, the, the actual terminology payment, I think that the word payment has um, uh, raised a lot of eyebrows because when people hear about payment, possibly they are drawn more to the attention that they're actually going to pay for this service. But ecosystem services have been paid for one way or the other. Maybe not the full scope. So what we are doing in Ghana is getting into the full scope of quantifying what are the different ecosystem services that our landscapes do provide. If you get into a forest landscape, what ecosystem services have we already put a value on and what haven't we put a value on? And in our particular context, what we are focusing on now, and I believe um, also related to what Andrew said, is about the carbon sequestration potential of our landscapes. So we are looking at how we quantify that carbon sequestration potential and receive, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it payment because really the ecosystems that we have, we came to meet them and nature has a way of paying for itself, just that we have come in and our livelihood needs have destroyed it to some extent. And now we want to get back into sustainable modules that ensure that these nature and base solutions or ecosystem services still linger on and are sustainable. And so where we are really coming in is what is the full cycle of the other ecosystem services that we have not looked at. So it's not really about payment, possibly it's about compensation, because if you get into the whole valuation, it's quite huge. Um, I don't think that we can fully pay for that, but we can offer some compensation um, for some of, of these ecosystem services. And at the moment in Ghana and on what I am working on and also linked to what the Forestry Commission is working on broadly, we are moving from 
from the ecosystem services that have been consumptive. So you talk about the timber, you talk about the food, to go into the non-consumptive aspects, the regulatory aspects. If we have trees that are sequestering carbon, that are helping the climate um, discussion, how do we compensate for these trees still standing without cutting them as timber? So it's more like transitioning from one ecosystem service into another and what is the value and what is the full cycle? That's where we find ourselves now. And I think that going forward, we would have to develop a framework that really depicts our national circumstances. We can hear about PES from different sources, but for every other country, their situation might be different. Even within the same country, Ghana, our ecological zones are not the same. What might work for the North might not necessarily work for the South. So going forward, that's where we are channeling our energies to, to define a framework that really identifies what type of ecosystem service we want to really put across to receive such compensation, who should benefit and um, who should really count in the decision-making process. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Ross. And that's incredibly insightful. And it's very important to hear how a country itself is really starting to look at these topics, because I think in many respects, there's a number of big actors, um, whether it's country, whether it's a corporation, whether it's international frameworks that are all seeking to address this. And I think something that's very valuable on this call is that it's seeking to bring some of those different actors to, to have a discussion together. And I think that's really important. So fantastic to hear. Um, Daniel, if I could ask that you could introduce yourself as well and, and, and address that same question, you know, what does PES mean for you and your organization in, in terms of project implementation? It'd be fantastic to hear. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, hey, hello, everybody. So I'm here. Uh, Rose is at, in the evening back there. I'm in Cali, Colombia, so it's actually sunny with some thunderstorm coming, but it's, 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 uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, in the audience also, we have one of my colleagues, Abraham Bafo, who has the same role as, um, you know, leading the team in Africa. And that's where, I don't know if you can go one slide, uh, if you can, if you can go to the slides back. Perfect. Uh, just briefly to mention in, in slide eight, yes, if you can go slideshow, yes. Thank you. So uh, my colleague Abraham works, works in Africa and that's where, you know, Perfor is basically what we try to do is secure sustainable livelihoods from sustainable lands uh, landscapes. So what, we, so what we are trying to see is this intersection of working with the people producing the commodities in their territories and trying to see how we can articulate strategies that recognize the work that they are doing and secure uh, their livelihood through fair income by being part of responsible supply chains. So over the years, we have moved transition from focusing on commodities to, to looking outside the supply chains. And that means looking at landscapes, looking at jurisdictions. Next, please. So, and, and my, my own background, background, although I'm sitting in Colombia, I'm a Peruvian forester and tropical forester working in the Amazon. And, and, and I worked 10 years on biodiversity conservation. So kind of when I look at cocoa in Latin America and, and these issues of PS, there are like existential issues. If the term is right, if the concept is right, if it's fair, if it's considered you know, the view from the bottom up or it's very top down. But for me, PS overall, it's an opportunity to recognize the amazing work that uh, the users of the forest are doing and what they can continue to be doing. And in this case, in cocoa, at least in Latin America, a lot of the cocoa produce is intermix, you know, is part of agroforestry systems. So it's, it's very interesting to see, and maybe that's one of my, the first of my four points is that we have to see beyond cocoa. So PES is a fantastic opportunity to look beyond cocoa and the territories where the cocoa producers, the cocoa producers associations live and try to see how cocoa together with other strategies secure that territory and turn la that landscape into a sustainable landscape with the participation of everybody. So that means looking at PES from two moments. One, when designing the PES system, that means who is producing the service, who is benefiting, you know, kind of what is the, the, the timeline that we are going to analyze what can be done and the impacts of, of the strategies being implemented. 
And, and think on the long term, we have seen PES that sometimes last for a couple of years, and actually that's, you know, overall is not enough. We've seen some companies that are trying to invest on PES and said, I need to see the results right now in the second year. And sometimes that's not possible because in some cases we are trying to internalize sustainable practices that to show results need commitment over the long term on security, you know, or need commitment on the long term. So it's important what we see beyond COCO and we see beyond, you know, what we can see uh, to a very short term horizon for these PES to, to demonstrate full, to fully demonstrate results. The second, the second point is that PES has, is a fantastic opportunity to help in the agenda of securi securing rights. And, and in this case on land rights, you know, showing or showcasing the positive impact of people that are living in or within a, you know, surrounding or within a forest. And cocoa is one of their income streams and that secures the, the forest frontier in that sector. And it helps recognizing that although in some cases, in some countries without, they don't have all the legal papers, but they have been inhabiting those territories for a long time and they have been able to, to turn into stewards of that land. The third point, in, in my in my experience is also making sure that the PS ensures that the delivery of co-benefits means not only on the environmental side but also on the social side because sometimes there is a distortion and I think Ross has alluded to that in the word payments and so people see that like very instrumental somebody's going to pay me for not cutting the tree or somebody's going to pay me for doing something and that's usually those results show ups on the environmental side, but with the co-benefits, the idea is also that the structure, if we look at PES in a given territory, ensures not only the environmental, but also social outcomes that are positive for the producers or the associations that are working together. And finally, for us, I think for, for successful PES that over the long term deliver the results that are expected is that also whoever is uh, designing and implementing these PS that understand the real, the local context and the local realities, and therefore the PS and the compensation or payment that it brings about, it's also a fair benefit sharing, and that's very important because in the cocoa supply chain as well, the growers receive the less of the margin of the whole supply chain. So it's also very important that we analyze how much goes to the growers per se of doing that and also within those associations, those communities and those families, how those resources are invested. Are those invested for the well-being of the and the livelihood and, and improving the livelihood of the families that are part of it or is just considered like an another income street, a stream and another uh, money that's, that is good to buy a satellite dish to watch TV. And I think that's very important when putting this up, that it's not only that we secure that there are funds to compensate or to pay the growers, the producers, but also is how that additional income is going to be used for the well-being of those that are involved in that production. Thank you, Andrew. Very important indeed. No, absolutely. That's, that's fantastic feedback. And I really enjoy the perspective of the interlinkages between payment for ecosystem services and other ecosystem and livelihood goals that ProForest really envisions. And Roslyn, you brought up a similar point. You know, this is a holistic view on potentially accomplishing a number of different things or providing structures or momentum towards a number of different goals that we all collectively care about within the WCF and the CFI. So thank you. Now, Mark, are you able to hear me? Yes, 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 Andrew, fine, and I can hear you. Of your video coming back online. <laughs> um, can I ask you the same Sorry. question? Okay. Um, why don't I ask to you as Impactum, so for reference, Impactum is a great organization that, that Pierre Perger has a lot of time for. Um, we, we interact with each other a fair bit in West Africa, but perhaps you could introduce Impactum a little bit and, and answer that same question then from your end. You know, what does PES mean for you and your organization in terms of implementation? Yes, yes Andrew, thank you. And thank you so much for taking over. Uh, technology is not always easy. Um, as um, you know, I've been listening to um, what my colleagues uh, just said. Uh, PES, these three acronym, uh, acronyms, uh, Payment for Environmental Services, 
uh, may be considered as something new in the in the cocoa value chain, uh, but it has already been implemented in in other areas and other sector, different sectors. But uh, what we have been doing on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in, in West Africa and Cote d'Ivoire within Pactum uh, is uh, within a public-private partnership uh, with uh, the private sector Mondelez as a pioneer and uh, also the government of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the, the Red Plus Secretariat. And uh, what is amazing is that uh, when, when I talk to some of the partners about uh, the PES, uh, talking about the technical issues, because we are managing three different technical uh, uh, paths. Uh, first, uh, agroforestry, but also conservation and reforestation. And actually what came uh, from our discussion is that uh, it's not just a technical approach. It's a really transformation way uh, landscape transformation approach uh, because when talking about implementing PES we are also talking about empowering communities uh, it's landscape communities uh, coming back bringing back to the table uh, all the nature based solution uh, and uh, and uh, link to the economic uh, uh, challenges for the farmers uh, uh, link to these uh, incentive mechanisms uh, we're also talking about uh, changing behavior uh, uh, because uh, it's, 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 it's not just a question of payment. It's a question of bringing uh, to the tree the value uh, and bringing uh, to the mind of the farmers, of the communities, that what they are getting to involve in is also an economic challenges that can also be uh, uh, bring them some some uh, some profit or some return. I think really that it's a cross-cutting uh, issue because uh, uh, we, we, we can also talk about uh, enabling environment. I was talking about the public-private partnership and I'm, I'm glad that uh, Rosaline is, is also in the panel because uh, she's been implementing that also in Ghana. And uh, definitely PES, uh, technical, but I think that it's a way to accelerate, to, catal to catalyze the transformation of the landscape, uh, to put the trees uh, um, at the heart of the landscape. And this is what is uh, key for us uh, with Impactum on the ground. We've been also uh, supporting uh, women uh, the, the, uh, because it's very key for us and for Mondelez, um, promoting everything around the VSLA, around the nurseries, uh, and they are playing an, an, a major role. Uh, uh, so I think that this is also key. Transformation. For me, this is what is key with the, the PES. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so obviously a lot of different directions that we could go in because it has demonstrated how powerful PES can be to accomplish a lot of goals. One, you know, as a next step, and some of you have already alluded to this, but there's a lot of different stakeholders, and, and I may ask Victoria if you can put up the, the my second slide there. Um, there's a lot of different stakeholders that can potentially benefit and participate in PS. This is not just farmers, although they're fundamentally the key focus point of this in, in the context of West Africa. Um, and that one, perfect, thank you. Um, but it also involves government and involves intermediaries who may be financing or supporting the program or providing technical assistance to the program. So I wanted to ask a question of everyone, you know, what do you see as a, maybe a case example of where um, there's a business case or a justification to one of the different actors that you and your job are interacting with? And again, I apologize because some of you have alluded to it a little bit in your, in your initials piece. Um, just to give some perspective, what we've done here on this slide from Pierre Pouget is to say, we assume that this conversation is going to be very heavily focused on the farmer and we do think it should be and that's what we promote in our work. But sometimes it is useful to take a step back to talk about the actors that may be the ones investing and just say, you know, if you are an investor of different types, what is the potential diversified values that you could derive from PS that would drive you to be interested in this topic and invest more heavily in it? So on the left, you can see, you know, opportunities to finance a couple of different things that everybody's spoken about today, ecosystem restoration through agroforestry or reforestation, wetland restoration, ecosystem conservation, the protecting protection of existing carbon stocks, 
uh, and trees and the biodiversity associated with it um, in a number of different forms. And then also we do start to see a lot of work on the topic of things like regenerative agriculture or good agricultural practices that do contribute to actual ecosystem services benefits as well, even though they may not be as specifically restoration focused. And the different types of metrics that we've seen at Pure Projet, obviously we've already talked about carbon, but you could talk about payment for ecosystem services with regards to water services. We've seen this significantly in Costa Rica um, where, where there's been systems for payment of water quality and quantity for hydroelectric dams or what have you. Biodiversity, we've heard topics internationally on the topic of habitat banking or biodiversity banking as credits for biodiversity conservation and promotion. Soil fertility can both be measured in carbon or other metrics like nutrient reduction, uh, phosphorus reduction needs for, for agriculture. Um, and then obviously, and I think Impactum, you, you particularly focus on this, so do we, on addressing the, the existence actually of trees themselves as a unit of ecosystem restoration, and that being the KPI for the payment for ecosystem services. So we talk about it in that way, and I'm happy to have everybody support and, and offer some, their thoughts on those different KPIs or additional ones. But I just want to emphasize in this slide that when we talk about the business case for PES, Again, repeating the farmer and the community, the fundamental component of that. But there are a lot of other actors that should be invested and should be interested in this. In the bottom box, you'll see impact investors, government, supply chain actors, industrials and institutional investors, all which have their own priorities as actors in the global investment space. And you can see on the right, we've listed two key types of um, returns that we should expect for these different types of actor, actors. One is looking at risk mitigation. So protecting infrastructure investments, whether that be agricultural or hard infrastructure, that's something that you can see, I put a two and a five in the top right there, that both government should be quite concerned about. You know, government is responsible for the infrastructure in their country. If floods are occurring as a result of, of land degradation over time, the government's gonna be responsible for reinvesting in that infrastructure. So there's an inherent interest in government to seek to protect those lands to reduce the degradation of those infrastructure. Um, resilience of yields and production, this applies to a lot, including the farmer, but impact investors could benefit from that in terms of the investment they make. Um, and as could supply chain actors, if you're sourcing a specific commodity, you want to help to produce and improve yields of those commodities over time. I won't go through all of them in, in as much details, but you can see for different type of actors, there's significant diversified investment potential and benefits that could be accrued from this, whether it's brand reputation, whether it's strengthening and, and creating resilience in supply chains, reducing costs. License to operate, as we all know, is a very important structure. We need to be good actors in the cocoa space if we want to have the license to operate with these communities, with these countries on a long going on a long term basis. So there's there's more than one way to think about the business case for PES. It's as diversified as the benefits that PES can, can emphasize. And so I just wanted to contribute that additional perspective to it, but I'd be really interested to know, you know, Rosalind first, you know, when you think of PES and when you think of it in the context of what you're seeking to do in Ghana, are there particular case examples of that business case that you really, you tend to emphasize more on or think about more? Thank you very much, Andrew. And and I was really enjoying um, the slide and the information on it. And this question about business case is always quite interesting to me because we need to understand where we are coming from. So if you get into cocoa, typical cocoa supply chain, um, farmers have been um, cultivating cocoa, but what business skills have been invested so far or what business skills have farmers themselves invested so far in their business of producing these cocoa beans that are being taken by another person within the value chain or within the supply chain who has invested so much in the business case. Um, you get to know that a lot of farmers are now being taken through farmer business schools, um, being taught basic things about bookkeeping because for example, in Ghana, cocoa, uh, cocoa production was being done more like on a household basis, a cultural thing, families are doing this. So one person inherits it from the other. There wasn't really so much of um, a bookkeeping record in there unless you have a few farmers um, who really see the future and make these projections. Now, when we want to make a business case for PES, whether it's for carbon or it's for the timber or it's for the cocoa beans, all of them are part of the ecosystem services. We would need to understand where each player is at on a scale. We cannot just get up today and say that we want to make a business case for it when we do not bring each other 
to some place where we can see that we all have the benefit of starting from, for example, level five, and we are all at level five, though some people might be at level 10. That is where the business case will start to make sense. Other than that, um, I was um, on one of the uh, um, events listening to the discussions on the living income differential. Why is it that these farmers who are giving us all these cocoa beans, we always have to find a way to make up for some of their incomes. There are some gaps, but then the companies, the government is not making it. We don't have those gaps to fill, but we are filling for the very people who are giving us these essential commodities. There is obviously a business case, but we would have to understand the history before we can get into maximizing the full potential of these business cases. We are not all at the same point. That's why in Ghana, what we are doing now for our climate change programs within the forestry sector, we are really investing a lot in training farmers on basic business skills, things that they would have to do that ensure that they are keeping records, they understand basic calculations, they can understand when something is not working and ask some questions. They, they, they should have that need. They should have that basic need. It should be in there. And this is what we are really investing into. Even if you tell a farmer about climate smart cocoa practices, what does that mean for their yield enhancements? What is it going to calculate into in the short term, in the medium term, in the long term? Are they making provisions for what these extra incomes are going to be put to? How are they investing them? See, all these are questions that we would have to ask and would also have to put in place the right mechanisms to address. So that's what we are focusing on right now a lot in Ghana. We are championing tree planting. We are championing cocoa agroforestry. But then we've also come to the realization that so far as we increase the yields and we do not help the farmers to invest the extra incomes or the other incomes, or we even give them alternative livelihood schemes or additional livelihood schemes, and we want them the power to invest these extra incomes that are going to come in, we are still going to end up at the same place because you would have to put in a very good mechanism on how you are spending today, how you are going to spend tomorrow, and how you are going to spend in three days. That's something that possibly government is already ahead of, of the curve on. That's something that possibly a cocoa company is already ahead on the curve on because we have already started with a business focus, but that's not the same for the farmers. So as much as we believe there is that business case, we believe that there should be a lot of investments to drive that business case and to bring each actor to a particular level where we are all at par and then we can all have a very meaningful conversation. Otherwise, as you said, Andrew, when you have these discussions on people, you only talk about the farmers or the community members who are expected to receive more, but when they receive more, what are they putting it to? Are they just receiving more? And are we referring to farmers as poor? Is that really what we want? Then we are not going to make any headway. Thank you. Very interesting. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll put it to you and, and just with reference. So uh, we have, uh, I think, 25 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, Victoria, if you could just remind me until uh, we go into the question period. There is a, a section called Ask Questions Here. You'll see it as, as one of the actors um, on the right, one of the participants. Feel, please feel free, everybody um, who's participating, if you could start to ask your questions there so that we can feed that question ask, uh, answer period later. And so reflecting on what Rosalind just said, which I think is fantastic on the business case and the farmer's reality within that and how they use that. Uh, Daniel, could you speak a little bit to, you know, what, what do you think of in your mind and maybe with more of a Latin American perspective on what is the traditional business case for PES in, uh, from your perspective? Yes, thank, uh, thank you, Andrew. I think at Proforis, we kind of our clients, we work with the private sector and with also with the governments. So when we look at it is what it makes a government or a private or a supply chain actor interested on, on investing on this. And we see it PES is, is, is a mechanism to bring investment that is not there for those that need it to secure their livelihoods because inequalities on the market or just because conditions, you know, socioeconomic uh, and geopolitical conditions. So for us is how do we recognize the contribution that they are doing on stabilizing the agricultural frontier, on managing carbon pools within a landscape, and, and of course on preserving, and in this case, you know, genetic material that could be interesting in, in Latin America, that's very important, you know, kind of we are identifying communities that have 
specific characteristics on the varieties of cocoa that they manage that are not anywhere else. And, and that genetic value is also important. However, that doesn't have right now market value. So PES could be kind of that concept that brings together public and private to say, let's, let's support these groups to, to, you know, and realize their practices and internalize some of the funding that they need to keep uh, implementing sustainable practices. What is the market, you know, what is the, the business case for supply chain actors is secure. I think in this case is secure a, a new line of supply that, you know, that values cacao of high aroma and high um, flavor in this case, you know, which is not kind of the bulk of the commercial uh, trade of cocoa. So it's, it's very niche, it's very gourmet cocoa for a specific uh, markets. So it's securing those suppliers and at the same time looking at them as an opportunity, for example, to, um, to do some insetting or offsetting because, you know, some offsetting if they are not currently of the supply chain, some insetting if they are their supply chain. So it helps them uh, invest on um, regenerative agriculture, but at the same time to claim some climate change uh, benefits and therefore they can manage to, because climate change benefit is what the companies right now has to uh, have to report on because they have to reduce their emissions. So kind of they can use the PES to use that equation, but at the same time, they can invest on the beginnings of a regenerative agriculture, which again, on my point, it takes some years to demonstrate that actually the, the new buzzword of regenerative agriculture is actually being done in practice. So you can use that element to just, you know, that element to, uh, to demonstrate that actually you are having an impact starting with the climate change and looking over the long term on what you're looking for at regenerative agriculture. And the long term view is that, again, you are securing a landscape, making them sustainable. And that means, you know, securing the agricultural frontier and securing some production that is in line with nature. But being in line with nature, it also bring enough income to those growers so that they can live a decent life. And that's very important because some people said, you know, still have that thing that if you go back to the forest, you can live from the forest, you can be happy on the forest. However, whoever has spent some time in the forest, you know that the forest is also rough and tough and you also need some support to have, uh, you know, to have, and people have changing aspirations of, you know, is not the what you know it's not the original aspirations that when you had of of living in harmony with your with the forest now people have aspirations because they know that half an hour away there is tv cellulars uh so they they have aspirations so i think pes can bring that thing of 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 putting the middle ground on the aspiration of of making a living and having some uh some access to let's say more westernized uh benefits and i think pes can help getting that middle ground that's for companies Absolutely. and for the governments is recognizing in this case for us what we try also is try to nest you know to get some blended finance and is governments have red plus strategies and sometimes need to recognize that in some places that is working and some producers are actually doing actively are creating models that could be replicated or, or taught elsewhere and 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 i think is when you get some of that um, readiness funding from RED to start, and then you can incentivize them in the next step with performance payments from the government side. And then you can add also the private sector actor with, with some of these uh, projects. I think when you have that blended finance, actually you have a model, a financial model that can work because what we've seen at least, Ross, sorry, that's my experience in Latin America. Some of what we call payment for environmental uh, services are that extra funding, compensation or payment, you know, whether it's in kind or in cash, is not enough to sort out all the questions of the fundamental root causes of poverty in the rural area. So actually, you need more elements added so that actually that basket is, is enough to secure the agricultural frontier and also to secure a sustainable livelihood for the producers. Absolutely, and I really like, you know, where you're driving us. I mean, what I read into some of those comments is, look, in any business, 
if you provide a service, if you provide an action, and if you do something that is requested of you, you would expect to get paid for that fundamentally, whether it's in cash payments, whether it's in kind, you know, there's a lot of ways to talk about payment, but you would expect that that effort, that initiative that you've taken is compensated in for some respects, but you also allude to the idea that, and we'll get to this in the next question, that who is benefiting from each of those services that come off may be different. And that creates some complexity that's maybe some of the stumbling blocks as opposed to the fundamental principle of this payment for ecosystem service. So interested to get into that in the next question. But before we do, Mark, uh, did you want to take a run of that question too, in terms of yes. an example of a business? Yes, that, uh, yes. around the business case, uh, this is something uh, important. Uh, I would like maybe to envision it uh, within two different phases. The first one uh, is that uh, as an implementing organization, uh, we are implementing, as I told you, three different modalities, uh, agroforestry, conservation, and reforestation. And we could say that uh, we have three different kinds of um, approach. Um, on one hand, we have everything related to capacity building, awareness, uh, because this is important also. Uh, this is not cash payment in kind, but very crucial because some, sometimes you can consider that the farmer relies better than yourself, that he knows exactly what is going on, he knows exactly what he has to do. And uh, I think that this is one thing. The second one is uh, the in-kind support. And the third one is the cash payment, but uh, linked to uh, the performance payment, uh, the result-based payment. This is part of the investment. And I think that we also need to look at the revenues, uh, revenues from the cocoa, but also revenues from uh, uh, all the non-timber uh, uh, forest products, also from the timbers, uh, also from the carbon sequestration. And when you balance this investment uh, to these revenues, then you can perceive what the business model could look like. We pilot this uh, PS project uh, in the Nawa region of Mondelez in Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, we, 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 we uh, the farmers themselves, they consider that uh, getting committed um, to um, uh, PES was, was um, valuable for them. And uh, I think that we need also to link it now to uh, maybe uh, a second phase, which is how to scale it up, uh, how to sustain it. Uh, this is why we are uh, uh, building um, um, an exercise, a project in, 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 uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the FSM, the Financial Sustainability Mechanism, uh, how to build a kind of aggregator where you will have uh, different kind of investors on one side, um, which could be interested in the value, uh, in the carbon, uh, in the timber or, or everything coming from the value uh, of these uh, activities around the forest, uh, then you need also to frame, to shape, to design specific uh, relevant uh, services uh, and products. But you also need to see how will be uh, the, the payment, the model of payment, the flux of revenue uh, will be settled. And at the end, uh, so important to target the communities, to target the farmers, and I like this idea of uh, uh, linking maybe the, the living income differential uh, to uh, the incentive uh, uh, um, uh, mechanism, because uh, at the end of the day, you need, if you want to have um, um, something sustainable, you need to see what could be the link between uh, the market uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the incentives. So uh, this is what we're doing in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, from the pilot project and also from the FSM, the Financial Sustainable Mechanism that we're putting in place uh, with some of our partners, uh, P4F. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And that's it's very exciting to see a mechanism like that, you know, present in reality in this circumstance. So, you know, it's very encouraging. We look forward to continuing to see the great work that's being done on that, that mechanism. Um, as with the last 15 minutes that we have before questions, I, I would um, again encourage people to ask questions to the ask questions here participant um, in the chat, um, just to make sure you get your questions in. But with the last 15 minutes, um, I would like to talk about, you know, a question a lot of us have is, what are the key challenges? You know, we've talked about the potential benefits associated with these, and we've discussed in some level of detail, some of the challenges, but 
I, if you could put up Victoria, just the last slide that we have with the concentric circles or the, the vector gram. Um, what we've done at Pio Project, the way that we think about it is there's a couple of key actors and communities that do need to buy into these types of programs. You know, as everybody has said, we need to support an enabling environment that supports PES. It's not about unilateral discussions because there are a lot of unilateral business relationships that are great, but they don't see everything in a holistic perspective. And if we are going to be successful in PES, it will take co-funding. It will take identifying the differentiated beneficiaries of different investments. It will take all of that to make this to accomplish this. And this is what you're going through with Impact and Now, Mark. So just kind of putting this up as a backdrop to this question. You know, when we look at the key challenges, and if we consider, and you can disagree with some of these assumptions, that technical capacity, frameworks and rights to assets and the rules of the game, and the demand and the willingness of different actors, we kind of put up there as three of the key barriers that you may need to overcome in the development of any of any activity. You know, we see from our perspective at Pure Projet, from a demand and willingness perspective, it's actually quite strong. We see government, as we have with Rosalind on the call today, quite heavily invested in this idea of PES. We see consumers driving the idea of environmental sustainability in the products that they buy. As a result, brands are driving through their, their branding, their platforms, their reporting initiatives, the demand for these types of activities to occur. Obviously, civil society is pushing for this as well. So from a demand and willingness perspective, we at Pure Projet see that there is a lot of demand. There's a lot of good energy towards these PES questions. We do find sometimes though that depending on the region, the country, the geography and the different communities, sometimes it's the technical capacity that can be a challenge. Sometimes there are some challenges related, related to asset tenure. You know, do we have the right implementers? Do we have the right accounting bodies to help bring collective actors together and be able to collectively account for this? Um, I think that accelerator that you mentioned, Mark, speaks to that very strongly. And then overarching all of this, getting everybody on the same page in the same conversation to say, raise my hand, I agree to this, I wanna do this, I wanna participate in this way and actually get everybody to the same table can be quite challenging. So I'm wondering if, if everyone on the call could, you know, from their perspective, Rosalind, you first again, you know, looking at this graphic or other challenges that you see in this space, are there particular areas where you think we're quite good and we're far down the line on some of these topics? And these are some key pieces that we need to work on. I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on that. Um, thank you very much. And um, again, the slide is quite useful. Uh, this speaks to the question that you've already asked. And let me just give an example of what we are doing in Ghana. And this also is going to give a lot more context to uh, my response to the previous question. Now, for example, in Ghana, when um, trees are harvested uh, on in forest reserves um, and even off forest reserves, there are some royalties that are paid to the traditional authorities, to the communities, because the Forestry Commission is managing these resources, but the land does not belong to the Forestry Commission. So um, we still have to pay these royalties. Now, um, we have been harvesting trees for so many years, and we have been paying these royalties for so many years. Um, social responsibility agreements are signed for contractors to do one or two things for communities, but we still realize that you go back and the communities are still impoverished, deforestation is still going on, illegal logging, illegal mining, um, unsustainable agriculture um, expansion is still going on. So what is really the issue? Now, that's where my response from the other question came from that now we are getting into business case models, but we need to understand that whatever income that is going to come in should come in and have some fertile soil to really grow. Because from all the payments we've made in the past, we still have the same issues. So going forward, what we are doing for carbon, and this is quite a novelty for Ghana, and it speaks to the slide that you had. We are looking at the right frameworks, the right governance structures. We are saying that we need to identify everybody that has a right to benefit from any payment from emission reductions or removals in our programs, in our projects. Now, once we have done that, we have institutionalized governance structures that are managed right from the community level through to the district, to the region, and then to the, uh, the landscape level, where you have different representatives representing different communities or clusters of communities coming together, and then they form a governance body that are in charge of that particular landscape. Now for every um, emission reduction or removal that is traced to the works of these landscapes, 
then they are compensated for, um, I mean, if we say they are payments, because uh, we believe that the, the payments that we are receiving for carbon now for the forestry sector, which is $5 per ton, is not really where we'd want to see ourselves, but that, that is what we are getting now. So we still have to make the most out of it. But then the program we have, or the initiatives we have, really do hammer a lot more on the co-benefits. And then when these carbon payments come in, the landscapes themselves, now it's not from government, there is no interference. There is a benefit sharing plan, which is given 69% of any carbon payment to the communities. Now they sit and then they decide that we are going to put this into community development projects or we are going to put this into supporting the works of farmers um, through getting them extra inputs and making inputs readily accessible to them and um, getting them better planting material so that farmers would not have to plant just anything that will not give them maximum um, productivity. We are going to enhance extension services. We are setting up rural service centers that give um, farmers um, access to these extension services and then also give them access to input. So we have come up through a 10-year process and going back to what um, Daniel mentioned, using our Red Plus process to develop these governance structures, which are novelty, they haven't happened before, which prevents just the payment of royalties to one institution. Now we are paying for uh, the carbon payments to a body that is representative of everybody in the landscape. And then they have come together to say that this is what we want to put our resources to. I believe that PES would work. Um, if it's PES, we call it, it will work, but it will work through a lot of collaboration. Um, it's not just about public, uh, private. Sometimes it should be even public, public. There could be situations where government entities in the country are able to identify that we should be able to pay for this resource that the forestry sector is providing. For example, for water, if it's um, the water agency or the water ministry in Ghana should be able to say that we should be able to pay for the, uh, some compensation for the forest that is um, providing these watershed services. So it could be government to government. It could even be community to community um, enhancing trade because there are communities that um, possibly have the markets and the other communities that have the produce that could come together and then work out things um, locally. And then we can also get onto the international front where we are trading um, with different uh, multilateral uh, institutions or bilateral agreements or um, however we capture them. But it's very possible to do this, just that we would have to do them through very well thought out collaborations, have the right frameworks, have the right inclusive structures more at the landscape level, putting in place the right governance structures. And just to mention that the governance structures that we are putting in place in Ghana do involve or include the government, it includes the private sector, it includes NGOs, CSOs, it includes the farmers, the community members. So it's really all encompassing and we see that this is the right way to move things forward. And um, very soon we are going to communicate our very first um, emission reduction uh, numbers. And we believe that that is even going to give a lot more motivation to the people who are working on the ground to generate these emission reductions from deforestation and um, avoided deforestation or reduced deforestation and forest degradation. And it is also going to help the sustainability chain because we are reinvesting into the, the programs or the projects that are already working. Thank you. Fantastic. And I'm going to switch it up this time. Mark, do you want to go first and then Daniel? We'll switch it up the for the last question. Yes, maybe uh, uh, because I like uh, what, what uh, um, Rosalind just said. Uh, it's, it's, it's really amazing uh, what is happening in Ghana. Uh, I think that we are uh, maybe on the same uh, path uh, in Côte d'Ivoire because um, uh, the government just signed uh, um, the emission reduction program uh, uh, agreement uh, with, with the World Bank. Uh, but for me, uh, at the end of the day, maybe we should consider uh, two or three things. Uh, as related to Côte d'Ivoire, I think that the, um, the land tenure issue uh, is still critical. Uh, and once you haven't addressed that uh, totally, it will be very difficult uh, to have a, um, an efficient benefits uh, sharing mechanism. Uh, this is one thing. Uh, we have made some progress on the, on the tree tenure uh, issue, which, is an, an, which was another, um, uh, another issue but uh, on the way to, uh, to be addressed. Uh, so this is for the land, the land, um, the land tenure. I think that the second uh, thing to be considered 
uh, is the community. Uh, I think that communities, we're doing uh, so much things, but so much things have to be done uh, for uh, to to strengthen uh, the capacities of these communities, um, in, in, because definitely uh, the communities, even the farmers, uh, they will need more capacities if they want to cope with this this uh, um, accelerating uh, path, uh, and 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 this is something that that should be uh, um, at the at the center uh, of the of the different. Uh, programs. And at the end, uh, lastly, I think sustainability is key. Once we'll be, we'll, we'll be done with uh, uh, the, um, the carbon revenue uh, from the World Bank, uh, $5, uh, not that much, but once we'll, we'll be done with that, what else and what next? Uh, this is why uh, um, we, we really uh, uh, like the idea of the uh, financial sustainability mechanism uh, because it won't be only a question of um, uh, bilateral or of multilateral donors, um, but also uh, we have to bring on board impact investors, but not only, we have to bring on board institutional investors uh, and so many actors. I like uh, uh, Rosalind's uh, uh, um, word on collaboration. Uh, but sustainability related to financing will be very key and is a real challenge. Thank you. Fantastic. No, fantastic points. And just with our last three or four minutes, if Daniel, you could jump in. Maybe. You know, I think they have said a lot that it's, that it's true and resonates here as well. But for me, maybe just to add some spice is that PS have not shown to be the, mag the magic bullet, you know, it's, the, it's not the silver bullet for everything. And there is, I think at least in, in the case in Latin America, it's still a case by case uh, model that, you know, is work at a small scale. I think PS need to scale up. Maybe what Ross was mentioning in Ghana is one of the ways to go is how do you achieve economy of scale? And by achieving economy of scale with significant resources is how you can make it more efficient that the different actors in the PES structure can be more efficient. And I, you know, in this case, what we want is that most of the resources go straight to the producer who is the one doing the work on the field. However, you need developers, intermediaries, uh, financial agents, and all of them start hitting the margin. The same thing as with the prices of cocoa, you know, kind of the, the more far away that you are from the field is the bigger your margin on all these equations. So at the end, again, we ended up like with cocoa, cocoa prices is that the producer in the field receive a smaller fraction of what I think ideally you would like them to receive. So I think you need to scale it up uh, in order to be more efficient, to get more benefits to the ground. And, and, also, and also that has to be a company with transparency and accountability so that it's very clear that everybody knows that not just because a brand is investing in a PES somewhere else in the world is that all the troubles and all the issues at the field level are tackled. No, there is still a long way to go. And I especially also think that climate financing is not at a volume jet that is able to sort out all the root causes of deforestation and forest degradation. We need more. And again, that's my point on blending finance and you know creating baskets where not only the government but also the private sector start putting money where their mouth is and if they are really thinking on this that they really put resources behind it um, and then with those resources we can start and uh, you know overcoming some obstacles and something that i don't you know that it would be great to hear if we have time for example is the issue of bankarization and the problem is, for example, if you got some resources, and maybe that's linked to the question that Olivier put on the chat, is that payments is not just giving cash to the communities, because sometimes that distorts the, the social relationship and the social conventions in a place. It's, it's actually how do you make very clear what the agents are able to put in, what the producer or the community needs, and how this is going to be, you know, get there because bankarization at least in latin america is not there yet so actually when you when they have the the promise or they have the idea that they are going to receive cash that brings a lot of trouble on 
over the long, you know, over the short, even the short term, and, and of course, over the long term. So I think there are still a lot of things for PES that need to be thought about, where you need the presence of the, the rule of law, and in that case, the presence of the government. And if that's not the case, you need to think on something that actually, pro some other ways of how do you implement your PES system so that it also protects the, the communities that you are thinking on working with. Fantastic. And I think that's a great segue into the questions because Olivia's question is the first one. Um, so we'll take about 25 minutes uh, to discuss some of the questions that have come from the audience. So thank you all three of you for, for your contributions thus far. And let's ask, answer the questions the last five minutes. We'll just try and summarize some of the, the key ideas that came out of it. So on that topic, so Olivier, um, thank you for the question on the term payment is often defined as a cash payment. But what about in-kind payments? For example, supporting farmers with distribution of multipurpose trees, tree registration, land tenure, setup of VSLAs, trainings, gap agroforestry and financial literacy, vegetable greenhouses, community development, etc. Would you consider those investments as a payment under the term PES? I think, Rosalind, you spoke quite strongly to some of those concepts, so maybe if you want to answer it. Thank you very much, Andrew. So if you're going to pay somebody or you want to consider something as a payment, first of all, whoever is receiving that payment should be able to identify that this is payment for me. So it's not just about an investor going to give out these incentives and thinking that these are payments. Of course, they can be termed payments, but do the farmers or do the recipients term this as payment? So as I mentioned, what we have done in Ghana includes some of this. Um, the carbon payments that we are going to receive, we are going to receive them in cash, but then they are going to go to beneficiaries, uh, more like in non-monetary terms, because they are already going to be put to different uses. So if it's for community development projects, then it's the whole community, everybody benefits. We're not going to give out individual payments. And if it's for inputs, farmers are coming together as cooperatives and they are receiving these inputs and be it trainings, um, be it um, organic fertilizers or whatever they identify. But what is important is that the process was inclusive enough to get the farmers to mention these as things that they would see as payments or things that they would want to see their carbon payments once they have been verified and paid for being put to. So an investor cannot just come in today and then say that I have these to offer as payments it should be the realization of the recipient to identify these as payments because ultimately they are on the landscape and if they do not see these as payments then they go back to the old ways that are going to still cause deforestation or forest degradation or they are going to go back to unsustainable practices but once you have that discussion and you're all on the same page of you can quantify these as payments and then you should all be on the same page to agree that whatever you are given is a payment for a service but it is in kind because what we are doing in ghana is not giving anybody cash we are receiving cash from the carbon fund, for example, under the EPA, we have signed for the cocoa forest program that we are implementing. But then when the cash comes in, the cash is put into in-kind incentives. So as I mentioned already, but we have done this not as government deciding for the people, but we have done this together with private sector, together with the farmers to say that this is what they would need at this point in time to drive the functionality of that particular ecosystem service to still be sustainable to provide and then also to impact their livelihoods and also contribute to the global climate change discussion. So it can be payment, but then parties involved should all agree that it is payment and this can only be born out of an inclusive process that does a lot of engagement and consultations across different st um, stakeholder bodies. And of course, there should also be a lot of documentation. I think that is where we are driving at now because interest can change over time. Today, um, I can say that this is payment for me, but tomorrow I can say that this is not payment for me. Now, that's one thing that we are getting into quite seriously in Ghana because if we are getting into emission reduction payments and um, 
these are resource-based payments, we would have to prove with documentation that we have done the due consultation. And also of the times when we're having our readiness process, I realized that we had a lot of consultations, but maybe we did not take stock of who was there or what who said. Now we are bringing people to be more accountable. You are not just attending a meeting for attendance sake. You are attending to make a point and that point is getting into the records and it has value. So you should be able to come to a meeting or to a decision-making meeting um, with that full consensus from your con constituents that this is what represents them and then that is what we are going to take forward. Otherwise, we would have different projects coming and go without any impact over the longer term. Thank you. I really like that and I really like kind of that explanation of payments can come in a lot of forms. They can be diversified. But it's the causality. It's between the act that the farmer or the community member took and the reception of whatever that benefit is, is really fundamental in accounting for that properly. That's really interesting. Um, Daniel and Mark, did you want to contribute to that, answer that question, or should we move on to the next one? Open to your thoughts. Yes, I do I just add one little Come thing, on, that is really... whatever the money is brought for, okay. it should really be directed to that. Uh, and it's important because some of the needs of the communities and producers are not needs of cash, are needs of infrastructure, are needs of support. Uh, Mark mentioned securing rights, which was also my point. So, it, and that's something that, you know, if you get that, you achieve the result that you are intended. And that's not, and, and I think you have to be very open-minded to see how are you going to direct the incentive that PS bring to the producers based on their needs and their local context. Yes. We, we had we also had this debate in in in, in, um, in Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, we agreed that uh, the most important uh, was the incentive. The most important was also uh, the support, supporting uh, the uh, the farmers and the communities, and most of all uh, having an, having uh, having an impact. So using uh, the resources to to make impact. Perfect. Okay, on to the second question. Um, so this is directed at you, Roslyn. So Roslyn's point on the need for investment and future thinking for farmers is critical for them both to build value from their farms and better understand the multitude of value they are creating. Could she comment on if the Forestry Commission is working with absentee landowners to build the case for them to have sharecroppers or farm managers invest in trees, soil, carbon, etc.? Thank you very much. And that's a very good question. So um, what we actually faced with is um, a lot of lands that are being cultivated by migrant farmers. So you'd have the landowners not being there, or they are not the ones who are fiscally using the land, but then they hold the rights to the land. Uh, and you have migrant farmers who are there, who are the ones um, taking um, all the decisions on the land based on some lease agreements that they have with the landowners. Now, in the work that we are doing, we have tried to identify who has a right. And in identifying that right, we have gone into, first of all, who is using the land, who is regulating the use of the land, who has an influence on the land, even though they might not own it or, might, or they might not regulate. For example, a private sector entity that is coming in to say, oh, I'm going to purchase um, your produce, or I want you to change from cocoa production to mining because I'm going to give you this. And um, that person has the power to influence whatever happens on the land um, if the lease agreement does um, uh, give the opportunity for that to happen. So. In all our campaigns, we are identifying all the different entities who have a say in what happens to the land. Because in identifying the drivers of deforestation and forest degradation, if you don't get to the root causes or the underliers, you, you might just be solving the problem at the surface. And then there are very deep rooted issues there that you are not trying to solve. So at every point in time, the governance structures that we are putting up, the governance structures that we are forming involves both the landowners and then also whoever is using the land as a migrant farmer or uh, as a local farmer who has not migrated from anywhere but just lives within that community. And we have seen a lot of value because, for example, 
Um, if we want to have more trees on farms, it's not up to the landowner who is absent from the land. It's up to the migrant farmer who is cultivating the land. So if you are going to give an incentive only to the landowner because they have the right or the title to the land, you might in effect not have any results um, on you promoting, for example, shade, cocoa, or cocoa agroforestry, or promoting the planting of trees, because whoever is on the land at that point in time is the one who is going to keep the tree or not. And your incentive package is does not include the person. So how does this work? So we have a place for landowners who are absent to understand that they are absent and the people who are on the land are the ones who have the opportunity or who have um, that particular right at that point in time to ensure that whatever programs we are putting in place are sustainable. So we have re uh, realized all these different bits and pieces and we have as I said, it's holistic for us in Ghana, and we've done this through a period of 10 years. So we have identified all these different gaps, all these different areas that could be problem areas, and we have solved them through our consultative processes. And we have come to a point where, for example, in our benefit sharing plan, most of our traditional authorities are the landowners, or they have influence on what the land um is put to, even if it's a, a family owned land, a uh, traditional authority can decide to say that this family should put this family to, the, uh, to this land, to this use. Now, these traditional authorities are getting a percentage of the beneficiary plan because of the role they play in harmonizing the people. Because when they speak, the communities listen to them because they are able to call perpetrators of illegal activities to book using the traditional customary system. Now, these are people who might not necessarily be present everywhere. Um, if you talk about fiscal land space and they have their palaces where they are, but then we realize the value that they have going forward in making sure that our programs and our projects are sustainable. So we have due recognition for that and um, we compensate or we have the plan to compensate um, for every actor once we have identified that you have a right to the ecosystem service that is being generated. Thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic to hear. And it's a very good question. It's a very tricky question. I think getting to the root drivers of these issues, as you mentioned, Rosalind, is something that is fundamental, but not every group picks up on. You know, it's easy to look at a landscape. Mm -hmm. It's relatively simple. It's much more complex than that. So great answer and great question. Um, the next question we have, and, and maybe I'll throw it to Daniel, you can start on this one. It is said that when living in poverty, it is hard to have an ecological mindset. How can we ensure that farmers will keep on preserving ecosystems when changing these high value conservations to cocoa farms will bring them much more money to take care of their families? That's a super good question because actually everybody has the right for a decent living. And if that means, you know, chopping down the trees because that's what it's going to keep your family fed for the next week, you know, who can say no to that? Uh, the question is how, how actually, that's also a very short-term vision because the moment that, that, that you do that, at some point you end up using all your lands and then you have to start moving. And that's when we have this shifting agriculture system, at least in Latin America, there is, you know, slash and burn, move on, take over new land. It's land that belongs to the government, but nobody's there. Nobody's going to tell you not to do it. So you move it, you take it, you cut it, you burn it, you put something, it lasts for a couple of years, you keep moving. And at some point, I think in our experience, people get tired of that, you know, nomadic type of uh, living on the fringes of, of legality style of, of, of life. And, and people want to settle in some place and actually they want to see how they can live from that place. And that's when PES, again, is a, is a benefit that can be added to what needs to be the role of the government and what, needs, and what can be the role of the market on securing that that production ensures a decent livelihood or, you know, a living income, a sustainable livelihood based on what, you know, those families want to do. And I think for me, it's very important that you build your, your PS, understanding that situation. What is, the, what is the situation right now? What is the local context? What are the aspirations? You know, where does the poverty line start, starts in that, in that community? What do they have? What is their natural capital? that should be protected because that natural capital is the supporting network for all the goods and services that they will need over the long, over the long run. And I think 
that's something also that PEs sometimes lack, is that sometimes you come with the idea of a project and you try to find who fits into that project instead of looking at who needs to actually have some access to those resources to stabilize the agricultural frontier and then see how you know you design a PES that actually answers those root questions of those territories. And I think sometimes again we have a very top-down approach and, and PES at some point, if you can mainstream it, will actually start having also a bottom-up approach when you are able to understand the root causes who is there, what is the situation of the of the rights that need to be strengthened or supported from public and private sector actors. And then is when you can actually say that PES is able is is a driver of improvement of livelihoods instead of instead of just a mechanism for bringing additional funding, you know, with a short term uh, lifespan. Fantastic. And and if there's any strong opinions, Roslyn or Mark, on that, we can. We do have a number of other questions, though, so I'm, I'm kind of in a thought process of give, give each of you one question. Is that fair? Perfect. And and so for the next one, Mark, I think this is quite appropriate to the work that you do um, in Cote d'Ivoire. What are the approaches currently being used within the existing PES projects in the cocoa sector to determine effective levels of payment for payment for ecosystem services? And I know this is a question that I'm sure you've addressed. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we, we consider, uh, we, con we can consider, as I told you, that uh, we have different phases uh, in, in the uh, project we are implementing. Um, we, we, have to, we have to support, we have to invest, um, and, 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 and this is the first, uh, the first stage. Uh, but uh, once uh, the, we have supported the farmer, the communities uh, to get involved in this dynamic um, of, uh, of, uh, of restoration, of conservation, of agroforestry. Uh, we, we now uh, go to a phase where, where we need to see and look at the result. And this is why we're talking of um, uh, performance uh, um, uh, payment, uh, result-based payment, and we are doing that uh, on with, with digitalization, which is very key uh, because it's not always easy uh, to to go to um, uh, all the farms, uh, mapping them, uh, mapping all the trees. Uh, but with dig digitalization, you can go quicker, you can go faster, and at the end of the day. Uh, it is a very relevant tool for monitoring because you need and we need to monitor uh, if we want to assess and if we, and if we want to assess the, um, the, the performance. So uh, in, in our project, uh, we have developed um, a, few, a few apps uh, going uh, from the, uh, the, the, the nurseries, the planting uh, to uh, the results. And, and uh, this is our solution on the ground. Perfect. And if we have time, maybe we'll come back to see if there's some exam examples, Rosalind, Daniel, that you have before we finish as well. Um, one of the questions, and I might take this one as we work in the carbon space quite readily. The concept of carbon credits is very interesting, but today it's a very cost. It is very costly to receive carbon credits for agroforestry, conservation, reforestation projects. How can we make it much easier and less costly to get carbon credits for such projects with cocoa farmers and communities? Um, Pure Projet has been working uh, for a long time on, you know, situations associated with insetting, where a company will invest directly in a community from which they source their commodities. And as a result, the ecosystem benefits and impacts that they are investing in can be in some way directly linked to the commodity that they're sourcing. And we find this to be quite valuable, but it has been indeed quite a challenge because the traditional frameworks for carbon credits were generally focused around large scale massive projects that were quite costly that made it, needed quite large economies of scale to be affordable. And that doesn't necessarily align with the procurement strategies of individual companies. Often procurement strategies are more dispersed. They're working with subsets of different communities. There may be overlapping sourcing from multiple companies in the same community, which is quite common. Um, so we will 
find that it's, you know, there's a bit of a mismatch between traditional carbon crediting schemes as a result of that, and maybe the interest of private sector actors who are seeking to invest in carbon that is linked to their supply chain. When you overlay on top of that also, you know, other strategies at national levels for carbon credits and, um, you know, other potential competing interests for the claim of those carbon credits, it can get quite costly and it can seem quite difficult. We are encouraged um, over the last two or three years, somewhat driven by the science-based target initiative um, actions across the corporate sector. While it hasn't necessarily answered the questions, in some respects, it has really highlighted key questions that are pertaining to what I just described. And as a result of that, you're seeing organizations like the gold standard, like VCS, really starting to reevaluate their frameworks for carbon credits and say, are there other ways that we could help companies or investors to value impacts made from their investments that are available in a more portfolio approach or made in a landscape way where we can have multiple benefits diversified and accounted for based on the different actors. And so those are two different ways. One that's more focused on a landscape approach and but the diversified benefits and how those are appropriately accounted for. Another looking more at the portfolio approach of how companies are uh, investing in cocoa globally, let's say, or even regionally. And both of those are being designed with an effort for which they can reduce the total cost of accounting for carbon through these investments, standardize methodologies and different practices to better enhance that value, and also focus on the accounting principles of how those benefits can be distributed. So I would encourage, there's two public programs. One is the value change initiative that Gold Standard has been promoting through SustainCert. The other one is the land scale program that VCS, the other, or Vera now, the other major crediting organization has been focused on. They're not the only ones, but they are two demonstrations of how your, your question is very good. And we are seeing the actors responsible for carbon credit certification starting to understand the challenge related to your question and starting to move towards frameworks that hopefully will open some doors to reduce, reduce costs and increase flexibility relative to the procurement strategies of companies. And I know, Roslyn, this also ties into, you know, how you as a government are looking at beneficiary dis, dis, uh, benefit distribution to private sector. I do have a quick question for you on that from Pierre Bourget's front. You know, how do you think about, we, we talk a lot about farmer benefit sharing when we talk about the ERP that the Ghana has been working on, what do, what do, how do you perceive you know private sector benefit? If a, if a company is investing in a landscape, how do they value some of the KPIs that they'll be investing in from your perspective in Ghana? Thank you very much. That's the question we get a lot, and we actually get in a lot these days because um, um, I think a lot of companies are waking up to the fact that they are making a lot of impact in the generation of these um, emission reductions or removals, and um, they want to know what is the direct benefit to them. So in the design of um, our program, and again, I go back to the price of carbon and what we are really receiving, it's $5 per ton. I've always held the opinion, and I'm not alone on this, that the $5 is not enough. But at the moment, that's the price we are being offered for forestry related um, carbon credits. So that's what we have signed up to. Now, because of this, that's why in Ghana, we are framing our uh, programs and projects within the forestry sector around relevant commodities. So if you get into the cocoa landscape, it's around the cocoa and it's around the other commodities like oil palm we have in there. Now, when we are able to get these agricultural commodities to be produced sustainably and within a climate smart environment, they already generate their own benefits. Because if you have increased yields, because at the moment, a lot of farmers are producing possibly around, when we started the project, it was around 400 kg per hectare. This is about two years ago. Now we are having um, yield increments of about 600 kg per hectare because different um, um, interventions are being put in the artificial pollination is there, irrigation is happening, the planting material that's being used um, is now improved in most places. And once you have this increment, then it goes directly to you as a farmer because you have more bags to sell. Now, once you have more bags to sell, then also to the private sector entity, the business person, you have the sustainability of your supply chain guarantee. Now, that's your very first benefit, which is not contentious because now you have the beans to buy and you are still in business. You can still keep operating. That is the very first benefit. Now, these are the benefits that we see as very tangible in our programs. Now, cocoa, for example, in Ghana, we all know the value of what cocoa does for our economic development. So if we have cocoa production 
being sustainable, not causing deforestation or degradation and still giving us high yields, already the government is benefiting. The carbon payments are coming in as an icing on the cake. That's how we see this. Now, the carbon benefits coming in as a nice thing on the cake. During our consultations, a lot of private sector entities already told us. Now, what we are actually seeing, we are even going to set ten of emission reductions, five dollars. That's fifty million. If we consider the private sector investments in Ghana's cocoa sector alone per year, it's more than that. So, over the period of six years for the project or for the program that we are going to get this 50 million in carbon payments. Private sector would already have invested more than that. So the discussion for private sector in Ghana was that they are already contributing so much. So what they would want to see is for this 50 million to rather be channeled into enhancing the practices of the farmers. So our private sector companies are saying that if they are going coming in to build rural service centers. Now, the funds that are coming in from the carbon payments should be used to build the rural service centers for the farmers. So then they make those savings. Now, that is where there are benefits coming on the carbon payment side. So you see that it's actually a win-win. That's why 69% of the emission reduction payments are going to the farmers and the communities. And government and all the other um, stakeholders are getting 21%, including the fixed cost of running the project, which obviously we all know that project management or program man management or already has some costs that are going to be incurred year on year. So these are the different benefits that we see. And we see the ones from the yield enhancements as more sustainable and something that really drives business. And then what comes in from the carbon payment side, coming in to develop the different infrastructural needs of the farmers, solving the need that private sector would have done one way or the other through their corporate social responsibility um, arrangements. It might not be the full um, cycle uh, um, taking what they have to do. But of course, if it's 100% that they were given off, now these payments are going to take care of about 25% or 30%. And that's a benefit that they can put those funds to other use. So that's how we have structured the program benefits. And that's how private sector benefits at the end of, of the day in the program design. Thank you. Fantastic. And that's that's very clear. And it's, it's a very interesting topic. It's, I, I can see why there's a lot of questions that you get. That's great. Um, okay, so we do have we have three minutes officially left. Um, the Zoom will allow for 10 minutes over. Um, we have one more question that I'd like to, to bring up and then uh, I'm just going to do a summary. Our, our panel, are you okay to stay through those 10 minutes or, would, or do you have a hard stop at the in three minutes? It's you. Everybody's it's okay? You. Nice. Okay, yeah. perfect. So the last question then I'll let everybody answer is, um, is there a need for more alignment on methodologies to measure PES, for example, building common frameworks or certified methodologies in order to facilitate the use and valuation of this mechanism? Who should lead this work? Um, and I'm going to tie in, there's a second question that comes with that too, because I think they're related is since the PES scheme is a collective hand push by several major stakeholders, who are the main beneficiaries of the PES project? So there's this question of who should be responsible for forming the methodologies and facilitate the use of those methodologies? And in some respects, you know, who does the PES system most benefit? So I may, we might go around the circle. So um, Mark, I think it's your turn. Do you want to start with that question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, I was very interested in, uh, um, sorry, before coming to, back to that, uh, uh, with the development of uh, Roslyn, uh, but linked to sustainability, uh, the carbon, uh, revenues. How uh, in in Ghana um, are they uh, do they envision to sustain it to make it more sustainable? But coming back up to the methodology in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the European uh, Forest Institute, together with the uh, UN Red Plus facility, um, uh, led um, a study uh, on um, the different pilots experiences um, project uh, PES. Pro uh, uh, so-called project and uh, uh, what what uh, the one of the final uh, uh, outcome was that um, uh, regarding the methodology and we need to have to have methodology common methodology common matrix uh, it will be also be part of the government responsibilities coming both from the ministry of forestry in Cote d'Ivoire and the ministry of environment but with flexibility because at the end of the day, uh, the implementers 
uh, the 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 uh, uh, private um, companies and uh, the implementing organization uh, have also to get involved in that uh, uh, evaluation and building this this methodology. Uh, I think that the Conseil du Café du Cacao is also doing a lot on that uh, when talking about cocoa agro for, uh, agroforestry. Uh, so uh, once again, it's a question of collaboration. We're coming back to that. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we are most of our countries, uh, I don't know for Ghana, I think, but for Cote d'Ivoire, uh, in the stage of revising our commitments, climate commitments, and uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, for example, uh, we uh, now uh, mentioned that uh, uh, the forestry is uh, far uh, the first contributing uh, sector um, uh, to, to tackle forestry, um, but also the solution. So I think that uh, we, would, we should also link uh, the uh, national methodology, uh, the, the uh, IPCC, methodology uh, related to forestry, agricultural, AFOLU. We should also link them uh, to the methodology of the PES. And uh, once again, it's um, from the government side uh, to uh, handle that, but with the uh, uh, commitment and involvement of all the stakeholders. Thank you. Fantastic. And with, so we're technically over, but we have 10 minutes. At the end of this 10 minutes, we will all be kicked off. So we won't have a, we won't have the ability to stay on. So I'd encourage you, maybe I will just go around the table, both if there's any follow-up items to those questions you want to address or just general last messages you'd like to say, maybe Roslyn, if you want to go first, then Daniel, then Mark, and then I'll just close off the session at the end of that. So feel free to come back to some of those questions or just overarching comments. Thank you, Andrew. And um, this question really relates back to the point I made um, at the beginning when I mentioned that in defining what um, payment for an ecosystem service should be, it should also be um, a country or case by case um, approach. Even within a country, it can be a landscape specific approach. But I also believe in standardization, um, standardizing some baselines, um, some things that are acceptable. Um, that there's a minimal that is acceptable or not. So there should be some level of standardization across board and it helps to set the right framework for different countries or the, for different entities to start defining what is best suited to their circumstance. But then once you have moved away from that standardization and then you have invested, you should be able to tell uh, that the ton of carbon, for example, in Ghana is generated uh, possibly um, at a higher cost than being generated in another part of the world. So that should also come in and there should be the right parameters for justification. Again, it also depends on who the buyer is and who the seller is, because if you are paying for something, then of course there are two different entities at the end of the bargain. So who is buying and who is paying? All do have a say in what you standardize or how far you raise the bar after the standardization. But to really go into that question, I believe in standardization, but then there should be another level. I know that, for example, in Costa Rica, um, they were selling their forest carbon uh, um, credits at a higher price in country through um, a national carbon crediting scheme where they were selling to other sectors, forestry sector to another sector. Um, it sounds the same for the international market where the carbon credit is $5, but in Costa Rica, within their own national arrangement, they're able to sell at a higher price. So that is the case, uh, um, a case of the example that I'm giving that you can have a standard and then you can also raise the bar depending on who is selling and who is buying. But ultimately getting onto who also um, leads that process, I believe that a re regulators are um, best placed to start that process and it goes back to government being the ones to set in place the right uh, enabling environment which includes policy because whether you are going to have standardization or not it's all going to be enshrined in some policy framework or policy document and of course we would want to see government leading on that so the regulator which is government in most cases is best placed to lead that discussion and i put emphasis here on lead and lead means that you are bringing everybody on board. It's not for government to just dictate what it should be, but to lead the process to build consensus from different angles. Thank you very much. Fantastic. And thank you for all your contributions today. It's been fantastic having you. Uh, Daniel, I'm going to hold you to one minute if that's okay. Sure. 
two thoughts. If there is any supply chain actor in this in this panel or any supply chain actor that looks at, at, at this recording there, it's like try to make, you know, try to, to invest on, on one PS. If you're interested, try to invest in one. Try to look at in which countries you have already a strong uh, regulatory system or enabling environment because the government is there and maybe Ross can speak to that in the Ghana case. But in many cases in Latin America, we are not there yet. The governments have not made progress. They are not beneficiaries of some of these carbon funds. So it's, there is still a case for investing in those countries where you are not there yet and where the public funding on PES could make a difference. And, and the important thing when the private sector goes into those areas is that you have, let's say, you have the stomach to take on the risk of investing on a readiness phase and then reap the benefits through a performance payment. Uh, because what we are seeing is that the private sector wants to get it straight into you know, claiming the performance without investing on the readiness. And in countries where the government is not as advanced as maybe Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, you need the private sector to lead the way, demonstrate that it can be done, but with the stomach to invest over a longer period of time and making sure that the enabling conditions are there. And that means talking with the groups, understanding the root causes of their situation and engaging with them. And if possible, making them also part of their supply chain to just not be offsetting, but, all, but actually being insetting some of those benefits by helping communities, helping producers, helping associations that are actually part of their supply chain and part of a territory that has a chance of being resilient, which I think at the end is what we are all looking for, that over the long term, there is resilience in those territories. Absolutely. And, and thank you. And, and Mark, again, one minute if you could, and then I'll close off. And if you take more than one minute, we might get cut off. So just warning you. <laughs> thank you. Rosalind, or oh, oh, just, just a quick one. Um, uh, I think it was, uh, it was very uh, interesting, fruitful. Um, uh, but I think that something very key is to look at the uh, sustainability approach of the PES. Uh, once again, it can be a fantastic tool of transformation, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, we have to look and, uh, and build um, the sustainability perspective. Thank you. Fantastic. And I would just say, you know, from my perspective, you know, the four of us are lucky in that we get to address the topic of PS on a, on a daily basis, but it's always really interesting. New things I find pop out of these conversations in amazing ways. One of them, one of the comments I really liked and just to kind of wrap up some of the key points, you know, Rosslyn's point on, well, performance payments can mean a lot of different things. Payments can mean a lot of different things. The relationship and causality between that benefit to the local community and the action they took to, to take that sustainability initiative is a fundamental component of what we're talking about. And I think that's a really standout and important point for all of us to recommend and understand. I think the other thing is the mutual potential benefit of ecosystem services to a strong diversity of actors and how in some respect they all have a, a responsibility to invest uh, in their respective ways into these actions. Although we can't wait for that to start, you know, as Daniel mentioned, we need to see some innovative actors start to take the first steps and really start to implement, start to push diversified uh, communities to get into this space because it's through those actions and through the good work that has to happen in countries like West Africa that we can start to propagate this on a global basis. Um, I think a particular um, other uh, piece that stood out to me was um, we also have to look at this as not just a one time, you know, great, you did a good action and you get some money for it, but there has to be investment in the communities. And that can look like a lot of different things that are required for the different community needs. Um, because there can be leakage of the benefits, there can be misuse of the benefits, it's not guaranteed, but there's so many th different things that could happen. When we want to be so directional about the sustainability of these programs, we really need to enforce that those are addressing the ultimate causes as has been shared here. So we're going to run out of time. I really thank you all. It's been a wonderful conversation. It's been, really been a pleasure. So thank you all, Rosalind, Daniel, Mark. Um, look forward to connecting with you in the future and to all of you, enjoy the rest of WCF. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Well, Wonderful you. discussion. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you all. And I look forward to connecting again soon, hopefully. Yes.
Thank you, Mark. <laughs> and I would say thank you to Victoria. Thank you very much. With us yes. as a